heard Dale say one time, and I gotta follow that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Welcome all of you, and I hope you come here to meet the Lord today. Uh, is uh, we have a bulletin, and in the bulletin we have a list of things going on. Refreshments. After the worship service today, someone has prepared refreshments for us in a time of fellowship. So uh, don't let that go to waste. Use that. Okay. Let me give you just a little heads up on why that happens. Because it's wireless and the stations, the air stations or whatever kind of changes. So it's not John Lee. It's not, it's not Kevin. But that's what happens. It, the interference. So... Um, just so we can and so we can pick up the choir singing over the great music. That's the reason why we have all the mics, but that's what can happen. So so that nobody thinks he thinks that's what's going on. And now here's Kathy. <laughs> wow, thanks, Jared. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I hope everybody got to come last Sunday to the Following the Fall Family Fun Night, enjoyed it. I think everybody did. I really appreciate the people that helped clean up because I had to cut out early. But um, but I think it's a great time. We had like 60 people. We had a lot of visitors, which was great. So um, so and we've got another Family Fun Night coming up November the 29th, I think. 26th? Yeah, something like that. I don't know my dates. But um, we're going to do the hanging of the greens a little different this year, so we are going to do it as a family fun night. So, um, so be looking for that. And then for those people that are on the vow committee, and if you don't know you're on the vow committee, I will let you know you're on it. I'll send you an email. But we will have a planning meeting on November the seventh for um, to plan the hanging of the green service. So, um, so that's coming up as well. And it's also in the bulletin. Uh, one thing I didn't have ready for today that I wanted to is a grocery list to help feed families for Thanksgiving. Um, I have been in contact with Bethlehem Elementary School and Wittenberg Elementary School, and they um, do have some families that need some help for Thanksgiving. So next Sunday, I will have um, that list. So be prayerfully um, you know, thinking about that, and if you can actually help with that, that would be fantastic. If you don't want to go shopping, if you want to donate money for that, you can just write it. If you're writing a check, just put on it um, for Thanksgiving or for our families, and then I'll have Denise or Rhonda know that you know to earmark that money, and then we'll go and, and buy the groceries for it. So if you don't want to go um, shopping, you can do that, and feel free to team up with some people. But for right now, I could be anywhere between five to ten families for Thanksgiving. We are going to be having an angel tree, also supporting these families from these schools for the children, and it will be anywhere between probably close to 10 families. I did get a letter from DSS today, uh, or last week it came um, to the church. Uh, it's a different contact than the one I'm used to, and now they're asking the church if we want to help support children um, in the county. I am hesitant to um, respond to that because we already have 10 families and with children and I don't want to overload and not be able and commit to something that we can't. So, so this year I'm going to bypass on the DSS and we're going to support more local to our community between Bethlehem and Wittenberg. So again, be carefully thinking about that. And I can tell you that based off of my conversation with the social worker at Wittenberg, once we put that angel tree out, we will have probably roughly two weeks to get the gifts back here to the church and then for me to get them over to Wittenberg for those families because they pick them up really early like the middle of December so we, we don't we're not going to have a long time to go shopping for those kids so just um, and I'll, I'll keep communicating that so we can make sure that we meet that need and I appreciate everybody that does help with that because I mean that's what this church is about is missions and I have a very strong desire for missions and this church has been phenomenal in what we've been able to support. Thank you, Lord. Through the men, the women, and the church whole as a body. So, and all the grace goes to God for that. But, um, but so, again, my ask is y'all just be thinking about what you can do to help with this coming up um, in the next three weeks, four weeks, something like that. So, thank you. Amen.
Thank you, Kathy. So, if you're a visitor, brand new member, whatever the case, and you want to fall into any of that, just uh, just talk to somebody. We'll meet you there. How's that? And if you want to be a, a new member, right here's our pastor. If you're a visitor, <laughs> they'll get you there. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Let us pause for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to worship you. We pray that our worship will be pleasing to you. And all that we do, Lord, we give you thanks. In your holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs> our call to worship, mighty is our God. praises for today. Isaiah 55. This is a paraphrase, not exactly, but the Lord's word goes out just like the rain goes out and it waters the earth and it does not return to him void. And so it is with our praises. Your praises are not unheard. Well, I thank you for a good crowd. I thank you for the being that's up here today. And yes, there's some changes. So expect the unexpected. <laughs> that's all I got. Has anybody got any praises? Thanks so much for bringing our message this morning. Amen. Amen. We got one back here. Because I just have a praise, and I think we just need to remember this guy in prayer. Our new uh, house leader, it appears, of course, we will see if he is a Christian that he is, uh, says he is and others say he is. And I contradict that. And mm -hmm. I'm just thankful and I'm guilty praying because this is not going to be easy for any, any of us. Yeah. So, Marsha, was you speaking of Mike Johnson? Yes. Oh, yes. The new house. Okay, good. <clears throat> Okay then. Our hymn of praise. Is that 385? They don't know that. They don't know that. They <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here. They know we are Christians.
Thank you. You may be seated. have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and his well, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is our Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead. And in all things all together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. <clears throat>
With that, let us go to the Lord in prayer.
portion of that that you've given us today. Take it, Lord. Use it and further your kingdom and your ministry as you see fit. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today is Noisy Sunday, right? Is that right? Yes, it's not for children. Yes. Not, but don't we take the play at your church? Okay, so I'm ahead of myself. Give a preparation. Here we go. <laughs> Sanctuary. Uh, at least I remember. <laughs> in them, but I've got this filter in here, 
that lap got for me. And this is a filter that you put on your house to filter your water. Um, now I can take this bottle right here and I can run it through this filter and you don't tell a whole lot of difference, can you? No. But if I take this well water that come out of Mary Lee's well <laughs> and I run it through that same filter for about, oh, I don't know, two or three weeks, I get a filter that looks like this. Yes. Mary Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I, I drank it for years. Didn't hurt me. <laughs> but but you get you get water you get a water filter that looks like this. Now you can't see that stuff in that water, but the filter will tell you it's there. So we've got a filter as Christians, and this is the filter. If you run your thoughts and your mind and your heart and everything through this, it will tell you what doesn't belong and it will pull it out, okay? And it will leave your life like this bottle of water, okay? Now I wanna add one other thing to that. What, what do you think would happen if I took this filter right here? You know, it's, it's pretty tightly wound rolls of this special kind of paper. And it's kind of hard for the water to get through there. So what if I took about half of this paper and I just pulled it out so the water would get through easier? I think my water would be clean? Probably not. So it's really important when we're reading or studying the Bible, which is our filter, we have to use the whole filter. The whole filter makes our water clean, makes our thoughts clean, makes our life clean. Bits and pieces of it or no filter at all, you end up with dirty water. Okay? Yeah. So thanks to Lack for getting my filters. Thank you very much. So let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the filter of your word. We give you thanks that your scripture is profitable to our lives to make us pure and clean and holy before you with your spirit and your word all working together, Lord, can make us suitable and fit to work in your kingdom. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for the word that you left us and the, what it means to us and how we use it. Help us to take it into our lives. Help us to use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The,
Reign is a powerful word that Jesus is used, used, often uses. It describes a profound, intimate, and enduring relationship. In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said to his people, to the people who believe in him, you are truly my disciple if you remain faithful to my teachings. <clears throat> Again, a powerful word that is more than just a word. <laughs> yeah. oh, man. I discovered this you know, a couple months ago. Woo! <clears throat> yes, excuse me. I apologize. I haven't had any water in the last couple minutes. I shouldn't drink some. Um, this word here is powerful. And Jesus, yeah. Jesus often uses it. It was one of his favorite words he used. To remain is to stay. To abide. Excuse me, to obey. To abide. To practice. To train. To prepare. To study. To meditate. To pray. To believe. To have faith. To trust. To keep watch. To arm yourself. To be committed. To focus. To listen. To embrace. To persevere. To endure, to hold, to dwell, to be disciplined, to worship, to retain, to accept, to follow, mm -hmm. to love. And John. Chapter 15, verse 9, Jesus said, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Like water this time. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Mary Lee's well water. Uh, thank you, Rashid. I appreciate that. Uh, Rashid said he had a few words that he wanted to say this morning <clears throat> and ask if, if, if he could say a few words. I didn't ask him what he was going to say. He didn't tell me what he was going to say. And didn't tell me what the music was. I said, God's got it taken care of. Amen. And he knows what he's doing. Yes. We'll just get out of his way. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a couple of minutes through when I get done through the hymns and through Rashid's words, um, I think you'll realize just how good God is Amen. and how he knows what he's doing. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, there is no group uh, uh, more uh, organized than United Methodist men. So a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago when, when, they, when they asked me, they realized that it was Men's Sunday coming up and they didn't have a speaker lined up and and, and Gary Litton said, well, get Matt to do it. <clears throat> and I was kind of humbled by that until I found out Gary Litton was going to be gone today. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what that means. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, it, it, apparently he knew something that all of y'all did. Uh, this, this, this message, is, I must confess, is not you. Um, it was originally uh, preached in another church five years ago by me. I didn't steal it from anybody, uh, except the Lord. He gave it to me. Um, it, and it's, uh, it, you were brought here kind of under false pretenses. The, uh, the name of the sermon is not Civil War. The name of the sermon is Liberal versus Conservative. So uh, I told them to put Civil War on the bulletin, by the way. Um, but seven years ago, uh, I was reading a devotion. I used to read the Word for You Today devotional before I went into work every morning, and I would, I would read the devotional, and I would read a little bit, and I happened to be using the, the Word for You Today at the time, 
And I was reading a devotional, and that devotion came from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So I'm going to read the scriptures associated with it, and then I'll pray, and then we'll get started. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 12, about 14, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body also in Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smell? And now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, let all the members suffer with it. For if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, if you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, are not all apostles, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. The word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the day that you've given us. I thank you for the word that you have given us. Lord, I pray that these words would fall on fertile hearts. And Lord, that you would help me in spite of all my weaknesses, failings, sufferings, Lord, to be able to glorify you in these moments. And I thank you for allowing me to be used in Jesus' name. So I said this came from a devotion. Excuse me, it's totally dry. Um, I said this came from a devotion, and the devotion read those scriptures, and it began to make several statements. And my reaction to the statements was somewhat like this: the statement was, "In the church, the white needs black. Yes, Lord. Hispanic needs Asian. Yes, Lord. Man needs woman. Yes, Lord." Southern needs Yankee. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> Conservative needs liberal. Wait a minute. Lord, we got to have a discussion about this. I mean, I'm a conservative guy, okay? Uh, politically, socially, biblically. Lord, what? Wait a minute, you know. I, I mean, I fight liberal thought liberal feelings. I give money to organizations that fight liberal thought and liberal feelings, Lord. If I need liberals, you're going to have to tell me why. <laughs> I mean, God said they're part of the body. I said, yeah, but aren't they like, you know, hair or toenail? Some of them come off and sweep them off the floor. I mean, you know, help me here, Lord. I don't understand. Generally speaking, according to Columbia Encyclopedia 3rd edition, liberalism is a general faith in progress 
the ability and goodness of man, firm belief in the importance of rights, <clears throat> welfare of the individual, and advocates for steady change. <clears throat> in other words, liberalism or liberal mentality is people focused. Okay? Conservatism equals a desire, according to the same encyclopedia, a desire to maintain the existing order, values highly the wisdom of the past, generally opposed to widespread reform. So for the sake of argument this morning, I want you to understand that conservatism is mission-oriented. The mission is valuable above all. Now, it's not my intention to paint you into an individual camp, okay? This is a wide spectrum. You know, you have people who are, are, are far right and people who are far left, and then there are people in the middle, and this is, this is a wide spectrum, and there are people all along that spectrum. So what is the problem? The problem is a world system that is trying to narrow that spectrum and drive us into the particular camp. Extremes have taken over each side, socially, politically, and these extremes have even crept into the church. The prevailing ideology today, politically and socially, is one of dominate or be dominated. I think we can all agree that's true. You can turn on the news and you can see it. I think it's interesting that during World War I, you know, you had you had the battles in Europe, it, it was trench warfare, and you had one army on this side in trenches and one army on the other side in trenches. And what did they call the part in the middle? No man's land. No the middle anymore is no man's land. Nobody wants to be caught. What happened to people in no man's land? They all died. <laughs> so our prevailing world system today tells us as Christians, you got to be on one side or the other. Don't be caught in the middle or you're dead. Okay? Liberal, uh, I've got a few photos that I want to put up. Uh, Kathy's going to put up for me. So um, if you think about liberal extremes in church, you may think of something like this. This is the, uh, I think this is the pot church in Indiana. They smoke marijuana before they worship to get closer to God. That's pretty, uh, pretty liberal. Uh, or you may think of a church like this second one. <clears throat> this is a church that celebrates in what God has called sin. But on the conservative side of things, um, you may think of a church like this. For any of you who don't know, that's Westboro Baptist Church uh, in Kentucky. It took me 20 minutes to find a slide that I could put up in church. Liberals have their favorite verses. Uh, probably the favorite verse of liberals would be Matthew 7, 1. Anybody know what that is? They're really on a note the first two words are there. Judge not. Conservatives have their favorite verses. I had my favorite at one time. Uh, probably the entirety of Romans chapter 1. But particularly verse 32. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same but also approve of those who practice them. Favorite verse among conservatives. So when conservatism gets out of hand in the church, you get something akin to the Roman Inquisition, which by conservative estimates, the Roman Catholic Church killed between three and 5,000 people over a period of 700 years. Why? We're conservative. When liberalism gets out of hand in the church, you get churches that celebrate sin instead of mourning it or saving man from it. Liberalism is socialism at its best and anarchy at its worst. So these differences in people, this is nothing new. It showed up in the book of Acts in the New Testament 
in a story that happened between Paul and Barnabas. And I want you to think again what I mentioned a minute ago. Socialism is people-oriented. Conservatism is mission-oriented. And I'll explain to you how that fits in here in just a second. But in Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement. Then after some days, this begins with verse 36, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit the brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with him John called Mark. But Paul insisted they should not take with him the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them in the work. And the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. Now I'm going to stop right there a minute and just back up. If you back up a couple of chapters in 13, you'll find out that Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, who was a relative of Barnabas, by the way, had gone on a missionary journey. And when they got ready to set sail and go to Perga, John left and went back home. So John Mark didn't go on with him. He left him. The Bible doesn't say why. Could have been homesick. Parents could have been sick. Could have had a girlfriend. Could have been scared. I don't know. But for whatever reason, John did not go on. This was a unpardonable sin to a mission-minded person. Paul was mission-minded. The mission mattered more than anything. The work had to be done. I can't count on this guy. We're going out again. I'm not taking him with us. Barnabas said, wait, wait a minute, Paul. He's, you know, yeah, he, he failed us on the first mission trip, but, you know, we're, we're about saving people. We're about spreading the gospel to people. Uh, God is a God of second chances. I say we take him again. And Paul insisted, no. It says the contention became so sharp that they parted one another, but the word contention doesn't do it justice. In the Greek, they had a fight over John Mark. It was personal, ugly fight. These two great men of the Bible were in serious disagreement. So it's kind of interesting. Barnabas' name <laughs> means son of encouragement. And Paul had actually benefited from Barnabas' mentality earlier. If you back up a couple of more chapters to Acts 9, I believe it is, when Paul was converted, you remember his name was Saul. He persecuted Christians. He went into Jerusalem and drug them out of their houses accused them of being Christians, had them persecuted. He was standing in agreement when Stephen was stoned. This is a bad guy. He encounters God on the road to Damascus and gets converted. And when this happens, he preaches in Damascus and then he goes down to Jerusalem and he tries to join the disciples. And they won't have anything to do with it. Why, this guy... This is the guy that was dragging us out of our homes not too long ago. We're not, you know, don't come in here and tell us you've changed. We're not having anything to do with you. Yeah. Guess who shows up and vouches for Paul? Barnabas shows up and says, hey, guys, this man's changed. The man who offers a second chance to Paul is Barnabas. He's changed. And he brings him to the disciples in Jerusalem. And they, they bring him in and, and welcome him after a testimony from Barnabas. And now here's the same Barnabas wanting to give John Mark a second chance. And Paul is, nope, not going to happen. Acts chapter 15 goes on to say, Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commanded by the brethren to the grace of God, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So, 
God's word was spread on two fronts as a result of this argument. So God took this and used it as a success, but it was still a bad situation. So what's the solution to this world system and this ideology that's trying to take us and pull us in two different directions? The solution is to remember a few things. Number one, we are all in a covenant with God and with each other. And we all have a leaning. We're all somewhere on this spectrum of ideas. And this spectrum is not a bad thing. Some people are mission oriented. That's what matters. They're laser focused on the mission. I don't want anything to mess up my mission. Some people are people oriented. The world would have you to believe that you're enemies and you should fight each other. But like all things, God shows us a better way. We must filter our thoughts and our minds through the word of God. We should live, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is personal. Personal. I also believe we should live second. Corinthians 10 4 and I've begun to see this in a new light 2 Corinthians 10 4 excuse me for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal I'm going to start out reading this as a conservative guy I am <clears throat> if you don't mind the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God yes for pulling down strongholds yes Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Yes, Lord, I'm ready to cast down arguments. I'm ready to pull down strongholds. I'm ready to go to war. I'm ready to fight. I got my gloves on. I'm trained up. What do you want me to hit? <laughs> Bringing every thought into captivity. To the obedience of Christ. Wait a minute. <laughs> He's talking about my life. I wanted to fight something else. God said he wanted me to go to war with my own mind. And my own heart. Being ready to punish all disobedience when? When your obedience is fulfilled. You want to go fight the world? Fight the battle here and here first. Then you can go fight the world. War begins in your head and your heart. So if you're a conservative-minded person and you run your conservatism through the word of God and you let it filter your thoughts and your feelings, what do you think that person would look like? I've got another photo to show you what I think it would look like. I think it would look like this. You got it, Kevin? Okay? There you go. <laughs> One of the things that I always loved about Billy Graham is whenever he did interviews on television or the newsprint or whatever, people would try to trip him up by asking him tough questions, you know, about controversial subjects. What did Billy Graham always do? went straight to the Bible. He didn't say, I believe, we believe, the church believes. He didn't say any of those kind of things. Every time without fail that you can remember Billy Graham having an interview, he would always say, well, I don't know about that, but the Word of God says this, and I want to know the Word of God. He was one of the great watchmen on the walls, what I call him, of the 20th century. He was the one who stands on the wall 
in the sheepfold and looks for the enemy or the city and says, okay, the enemy's coming. Right there he is. That's what he's trying to bring into the camp. You need to watch out for this. That was Billy Graham's mission. That's what he did. But what about a liberal-minded person? If you had a liberal-minded person who ran their thoughts and their mentalities through the word of God, what would it look like? I think it would look like this. <clears throat> Mother Teresa spent all of her time in mission in Calcutta, working with the lowest of the low people. There was no one more people-oriented than Mother Teresa. When she died, she had nothing, virtually nothing. Everything she had, she poured into the ministry and poured into the people that she served. And no matter what your feelings are in the Roman Catholic Church, I'm going to tell you, if she ain't heaven, ain't nobody going. Because <laughs> <laughs> nobody lived, Jesus is my Savior that I know of more than Mother Teresa. She gave <laughs> her life to people. It's interesting to note, kind of at the end of Paul's life, he kind of came around to John Mark in 2 Timothy verse 4 11 when he's getting near the end of his life and he's in prison Paul says only Luke is with me and get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for the ministry that's about as much love as you're going to get out of us conservatives <laughs> you're useful to me. he kind of had a change didn't he the challenge is I need you. If you're a conservative-minded person, I need you. God needs you. The church needs you. But it needs you to understand that the world wants to drag you apart and pull you to the fringes. You must run your thoughts and minds through the Word of God. If you're a liberal-minded person, I need you. God needs you. The church needs you. It needs you to run your mindset through the word of God. It's interesting to note that Jesus did both. When he encountered the woman at the well, the fact that he actually spoke to her angered the conservative crowd, and then he told her about her sin and told her to go and sin no more, and that angered the liberal-minded crowd. Jesus was capable of doing both. Black loves to talk about the iron sharpening iron. Iron sharpens iron. What happens? Spark fly. Sparks fly. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of the debate. Don't be afraid to go to God's word. Don't be away. Don't be afraid to be sold out to God's word when you're when you're talking about tough subjects. But what happens when iron sharpens iron, like Lat says? Sparks fly, and you're coming into that point of that sword where God, you're becoming something that God can actually do something with. When iron sharpens iron, what happens to the metal out on the fringes? It's destroyed. It's destroyed. It's removed. Isn't it interesting that the world tries to drive a wedge in between people and accentuate our differences and drive us apart and drive us into camps, but God wants to hone us to a point and to a sword that he can do business with. Yeah. It's completely opposite. Mm -hmm. You have the world system and you have God's system. Yes. The world tries to drive apart. Christ unites. Allow God to unite you. A church that is united in Christ is a powerful one. A powerful one. So, all of you are different. All of you are in different places across this broad spectrum. I love, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, Thomas pointed out um, that he, he had helped a homeless man find shelter for the night. I appreciate that, Thomas. I would have walked by that person on my way to somewhere else. I repent of that. I need Thomas to remind me of the mission of people, to help people, to stop and help people.
because it's not my mindset. You understand? I need Thomas to remind me of that. I need you to remind me of that. And we all need each other to help us remind ourselves to filter our thoughts and our mindset through the word of God so we can all be that sharp sword that God can do business with. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you again for the day and these words. Lord, I ask your blessings upon this congregation that they will always continue to love each other Lord, and nurture each other in the faith wherever they may be. I thank you for your providence over this congregation, your care for it, and your guarding of it. And I ask your blessings on it, on Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of benediction is 576. Rise up, O men of God. Thank you.